Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our economic and investment update. Um, I'm George Lagarias, I'm Azaris' chief economist, and we will start in a minute or two. Okay, participation seems to be flattening out, so I think we can uh, begin. Uh, hi again, everyone. Um, again, my name is George Lagarius. I am the Chief Economist at Mazars. I am joined uh, on this session by James Hunter Jones, who is uh, a senior investment manager within our team uh, and very knowledgeable on equities and bonds. So, um, we will start with James and his outlook on global markets. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, very good to, <clears throat> to be here today. Um, I think it is only appropriate, given everything that's taking place at the moment, to start with yields. Um, when we talk about markets these days, you will have heard us talk about the fact that a lot of what is going on in markets is caused by rising yields. And that was very true in 2022 and remains true in 2023. So it was a very challenging year for bonds last year, as demonstrated by this chart, where you can see that uh, US treasuries suffered massive losses in capital, uh, much more than they had historically. Um, and this has caused problems for other areas of the economy as well. So as yields were rising in the banking sector, we saw that institutions felt that they had to offer a return to the cash that their clients had deposited with them. Uh, therefore, a certain bank in particular, Silicon Valley Bank, which has been in the news a lot over the last couple of weeks, uh, although previously had been somewhat obscure and not well known to, um, to certainly to, to us in the UK. Um, banks started to invest in securities in order to, so that they could then pass on that return to depositors within their banks. So invested, the Silicon Valley Bank invested in treasuries. Uh, as interest rates rose, the value of those tre treasuries suffered and as their clients and customers got wind of the fact that they had these treasuries on their balance sheet and that they had fallen in value, there were concerns about whether that bank could pay out to its customers. And so that then led to sharp deposits, uh, sorry, depositors rather sharply withdrawing funds from, from, uh, from Silicon Valley Bank. And the Federal Reserve had to step in and the regulators had to step in in order to backstop those, those reserves. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank ultimately became um, a bank that, uh, that ceased to operate, and that has caused ructions throughout uh, the financial sector within the US market. If we could look at the next slide, please. So actually, the S&P 500 has chalked up pretty good returns year to date. Uh, been a plus four percent, and given everything that's happened, actually, you might find that quite quite surprising. But it does hide what's been going on in other sectors, and you can see that financials have suffered approximately down uh, eight and a half percent, and then regional banking index down about seventeen percent. And what this tells us is that investors and the market more more broadly are concerned about how robust regional banks are and how able they are uh, to, to ultimately meet the, the redemptions of, of their customers. I think it is worth pointing out here, though, that 
what we've seen in the banking system so far does appear to be isolated. So if we look at the next two charts or the next, the next slide and the next two charts on the next slide, um, you can see that, uh, first of all, the chart on the right, I mean, Credit Suisse, obviously, the other major institution, uh, which is no longer operational and has been merged with, with UBS at, on the orders of the Swiss, uh, Swiss, Swiss National Bank and the Swiss regulator, uh, that with Credit Suisse, it had really been what you might call a, a, a slow bleed or a, a slow puncture. And there had been a number of very high profile issues with the bank uh, and its risk management had been flagged as being very weak over the last uh, few years. And if you look at the share price, which is shown in the right hand chart, you can see that actually it had been, this had been broadly understood by the market and reflected in the share price. Um, it's not to say that the final outcome was understood. I think for a lot of people, actually, the, um, the, the disappearance of Credit Suisse will come as a, as a major shock. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the issues had been, had been well telegraphed in advance. Uh, with Silicon Valley Bank, again, it was a bank that relative to the capital that it had, it was it, the investments that it had made, really the losses on those investments had quickly uh, obliterated the capital. So if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you can see this is the level of common equity tier one capital, which is the blue line. And then the gold line is if you take away uh, any losses, which had uh, which were not realized, i.e., losses on investments that that the banks hold, and you can see that Silicon Valley's um, Silicon Valley Bank's equity had been effectively obliterated by those losses. Whereas if you look at the other banks, they still have uh, decent equity buffers even after losses on investments held on the balance sheet. So again, we are talking about two quite quite exceptional exceptional cases with these two banks. If we could look at the next the next slide, please. One thing that is really important, and it comes back to the first slide, and it's this idea that bonds suffered a very difficult 2022. The other side of that coin is that yields on fixed income securities are a lot higher now than they were 12 months ago, 14 months ago. Um, and that is going to change the dynamic of bonds in a portfolio because when interest rates rose from, from zero, it caused a sell-off in bonds and it also caused volatility in the equity market. Now, when we see volatility in the equity market, bonds become a safe haven and they become a place where investors can park money during in order to ride out that volatility. So I think that it's worth pointing out here that we really are in quite a different environment than we were at the beginning of last year. And therefore, a repeat of last year looks quite unlikely at this stage. If we could have the next slide, please. However, it is worth also noting that stresses might persist. I think that Although I've said that this, where we've seen issues with banks, you know, it was well, well telegraphed in the case of Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank was somewhat of an exception among U.S. banks. Um, it's not, you know, it, it's it was still. If you had asked someone two weeks ago, oh, you know, is Credit Suisse going to going to go bust or is going to disappear or going to merge with UBS or, you know, are we going to have an issue with with Silicon Valley Bank, people would have said no. You know, they're not always visible to the outside observer. So I think we've got to be realistic and say that when interest rates are as high as they are, then you know stresses can still can still persist. And this chart is called the the TED spread. But what it is is it shows the difference in uh, yields ultimately between interbank lending and the yields on treasuries. And so when this line spikes higher, 
what it says is that investors are demanding more return in order to lend to banks compared to lending to the US Treasury. Uh, obviously, you would expect some increased yield if you were lending to a financial institution compared to the US government. But when the when the line really spikes higher, what it what it says is that actually there's an issue and people are not comfortable lending to uh, US financial institutions. And it is a and you can see that obviously that the, the, the situations where it's really spiked higher. So during the financial crisis and in the run up to that, um, and then also in the time of COVID as well, again, where there were issues around around funding and lending, um, but those were resolved. So ultimately, this is a line that, <clears throat> that we continue to continue to monitor because it does give us a give us a feel for um, you know how com how comfortable the market is with the finance with the risks in the financial system. If we could see the next slide, please. Um, and I suppose this chart really. It is about the the benefits of a, of diversification of being in a diversified portfolio, and it comes back to what I was saying about bond yields. Bond yields are in a different place than where they were 14 months ago, uh, and so what we see now <clears throat> is we see that yes, there can be volatility in equity markets, but bond yields will pick up some of that sl slack. Bonds will will suck in some of that money. So a diversified portfolio that is spread across bonds, equities, and other asset classes, alternative asset classes, it will provide that diversification benefit. And therefore, you can see that uh, diversified portfolios are really the uh, a good a good safe haven in in the current environment. So if we could have the next slide. It's with that, I think, George, it would be great to get your opinion on some of these, some of these matters and the broader, uh, broader outlook for markets. Thank you very much, James. Uh, just as a reminder, you can put uh, questions on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will try to answer as many of these as we can in the last 10-15 um, minutes of this uh, call. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about what happened with banks. Uh, I think James covered it pretty, pretty, pretty well. My headline reading is that the story in the press was that banks all suffered or could suffer potentially from losses in, in bonds. However, generally speaking, uh, the way banks work and their risk management works is that um, the more uh, the value in bonds is lost, the more the value of the deposits go up. Uh, so generally there is an offset. SVB did not have a risk manager for nine months. Okay, it was a regional bank in the US that didn't have a risk manager for nine, for nine months. Whoops. Um, Credit Suisse, uh, sorry, Signature Bank, backed by crypto. Uh, Credit Suisse, it has been mired in scandal for the past at least five years. Um, so where Deutsche Bank was repairing its balance sheet, Credit Suisse was, was deconstructing their, um, uh, their business strategy. So the larger theme here is not that we have a banking crisis. We don't. This is not the risk that's currently playing out. Rather, it is two other risks that we had flagged early on in the year. And it is the volatility. Things are going to be moving up and down. And with it, we have policy uncertainty. It's not just that rates are high. We have no idea where they're going to stop and how long are they going to stay there. And that wreaks havoc. You know, imagine you could be a business, not just a bank, any business. And you want to, uh, to schedule your, um, your loans or what have you or your business strategy. How can you do this if you do not know the interest rate environment you're going to be in in, in one year? Are rates going to be 5%? Are they going to be 4 Are they going to be 0 Completely different strategy around uh, each, each one. Rates are, and the cost of money is very important to any business strategy because ultimately it affects people's ability to buy your stuff uh, or your services. 
Um, and the other risk that's playing out is a risk that uh, also has been flagged by many people in the past few years, private equity slash VC risk. So since the global financial crisis, uh, the regulators and governments had one goal, take the risk off the banks and put it into other vehicles, which are not that systemically linked. And by that, we mean where they don't take deposits. So risk is not now with banks. Risk is with the private equities and the venture capitals and all the wonderful unicorn companies, uh, which you see taking a billion for doing an app that nobody really understands where it came from. Okay, and these are the risks playing out. In the case of banks, it was the zombies that got hit. In terms of private equities, VCs, now we're going to see which are actually producing a product that has potential and which just received money because it was there and it was, it was cheap. Okay, and this is the risk playing out because in terms of um, in terms of uh, Silicon Valley Bank, their clients were mostly those um, private equities and and venture capitals, and they all had their own problems. Okay, so uh, it 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 wasn't just their bond exposure; they had few clients. Most of them came out at the same time, and most of them were facing their own liquidity concerns. If it wasn't uh, this particular or this particular instance that SVB uh, got hit, it would have been down the road in a few months. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, let's see how regulators and policymakers are dealing with that. Let's talk about the Fed, which has sort of a well, people can call it a two-pronged approach. I say it could be more verging towards a slightly schizophrenic, but we'll we'll get to that. Um, so on the one hand, they're telling markets, don't worry, the Fed put this back. What is the Fed put? The assurance that every time something important happens, we're going to pour money back into markets. So look on the left hand, uh, chart. This is, uh, the blue, uh, line, the blue bar is how much money the Fed had, by how much it had reduced its balance sheet, i.e. how much money it had taken away from markets in the past uh, eight to nine months, roughly 500 billion. It put back 350 billion in the last two weeks to, to, to shore up the financial system. And it's promised another, it's promised a total of 2 trillion if needs be in, in, uh, in, in different facilities. Now, to be fair, the type of money that went out is not the same as the money that went in. The Fed has not returned back to quantitative easing. These are credit lines uh, and, and those sort of short-term assurances that can it, it can take back as easily as it put them back in. Okay, so this isn't forever, this sort of, of loosening. We're not back in quantitative easing times. We can, we can say that with a modicum of certainty. But for the time being, what they're saying to markets is we're here, we're strong. Don't dare to short stocks. Don't dare to, to sell out bonds because we'll be here uh, flushing the system with liquidity. And that is their approach towards financial markets. But then, next slide, please. We have their approach to, towards um, interest rates, consumers, and your average business. And that is, they hiked again. All of them, in fact, and they all use pretty much the same language. The Bank of England, the Fed, and the ECB, the ECB hiked twice. Um, so we had three major banks hiking after SVB had collapsed, and they all use the same language. Inflation is one thing, and the banking crisis is different. And why are they different? Because we're going to use different tools to deal with it. Um, now, here is what is important to take uh, away from the chart. And if you don't remember any other charts from this presentation, just remember this one. It's not about how fast you hike rates. It's not about, um, it's not even, I, I would argue about the, uh, the time it takes for policy to be transmitted, although the, this is important. It is about the level of rate hikes. This is what's important. And as you can see, historically, most crises in the past 30, 40 years happen around that level of 5%. Between 1994, and 2000, uh, there were four big, at least four big crises uh, that erupted uh, around that time, uh, around the 5% uh, 
uh, rate. It was the Mexican bond crisis in 1994, where Mexican bonds and the peso collapsed. It was the Asian crisis, which was a, a lot of real estate going south. It was the long-term capital management crisis. This was a fund run by Nobel laureates, some of the smartest people in the world that went under in 1998. And then, of course, there was the dot-com bubble in uh, 1999 and early 2000. In all that time, the Fed did not lower interest rates, but they kept them high. So you had crisis after crisis after crisis. During that time, the Russian Federation failed to pay its bonds. It, it was, um, uh, it, it defaulted on its debt, barring the, the, uh, the bank that the queen had her money was sold for uh, one pound. Uh, so it, it's during those very high interest, not high, not very high interest rate times that bad things tend to happen. And we're back into those. At, at that interest rate is when the global financial crisis happened and the credit crunch that preceded a year before Lehman Brothers collapsed. And then, of course, you have this regional banking crisis. Um, so what we think is that the central bankers in their attempt to fight inflation, uh, they will keep rates up and that will continue to create volatility for the system. Okay. So these are going to be volatile times. That's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you have an investment portfolio. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you have an investment portfolio, actually, it's good to have a, a little volatility because if you chosen your manager correctly, you can get very good returns. Volatility means people running around like headless chicken, buying that, selling that, no idea what they're doing. But the good and the patient manager will see it, it's going to be much easier for, for them to see the real opportunity. Okay, from a mass exodus in, in, one, uh, uh, in, in one sector, for example, or another. So, as an example, regional banking stocks in, in the US have plummeted, all of them, whether they're good banks or not. Some of them might be good banks. I'm pretty sure there are fund managers out there who are looking at balance sheet and they're saying, okay, this is actually a good bank. I'm going to take a bet that it's not going to suffer a bank run in the next month or two. And I'm going to invest in a stock that's now trading less than half its, its book value. That kind of stuff. And you can only get that sort of, of trade or long-term investment if you have a volatile environment. If you have quantitative easing and everything goes up at the same time, then there's no ability to... To, to generate real alpha, as they say, to outperform the market. Um, next slide, please. Now let's get back to, to the argument. We had this, um, this framework a few, um, uh, sorry, a few months ago, which was we're trying to determine what sort of pivot the Fed would make, i.e. from being very tight on interest rates to loosening interest rates and maybe restarting quantitative easing. Now, there was the orderly pivot, which was our base case up until a month ago. And it said that, look, we're going to put interest rates up. Nothing is going to break and we're going to keep them high and then just slowly um, uh, lower them back to the neutral interest rate. Now, that was the best case scenario, right? And we had the disorderly pivot. Something breaks, all hell breaks loose, and central banks just rush to, to reverse policy. It, apparently, we have the fudge which is actually a very human condition, one would argue. Um, we have not quantitative easing. I know you know, I shouldn't have used that term. We have um, a more accommodative balance sheet by the Fed, money printed and thrown at the markets, and higher rates at the same time Okay, uh, to fight inflation. Now, I'm not sure whether this, this is, sorry, I am sure this is an interim condition and it can't last for very long. The needle will have to go one way or another. And we're not yet too sure which way that will be. Okay, it could go back towards the orderly or it could, uh, more things could break and then we could have the disorderly pivot. So this is right now the big debate going on within, within, our, um, within our team. Um, Next slide, please. Meanwhile, what markets are saying, 
actually markets don't have the same scruples as we do. They say that uh, the Fed is going to cut rates by uh, uh, 1% or slightly less than that by the end of the year. Now, uh, this is the blue line, by the way, where markets think rates will be in the next uh, few uh, sessions of, of the Fed. And the um, golden line is where they thought that uh, those rates would have been uh, less than a month ago, two weeks ago. That's just to show how much markets have changed. Now, having said that, um, we have to say that markets are not in thinking mode right now. They're in panic and then reaction mode. Um, this is just what bonds are telling us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that bonds are following a clear story. Um, just as a point of reference, uh, last week, uh, or at least, sorry, two weeks ago, we saw the U.S. two-year bond, one of the safest assets in the world, uh, move lower 1% in, in, in a day. This is a six standard deviation event. Um, and this is uh, the equivalent of 1.1 1, uh, 1 in, in 1.4 billion, I am told. Um, so markets are sort of panicking right now. So I'm not reading too much into what markets say as uh, as to where the interest rates are going to go. That's why, at least in our investment committee, we're sort of still evaluating the data before we decide which way the needle might might go. Next slide, please. A more succinct framework, and the one we have been using, is this. We know that the, this cycle, um, and it's very it's very common. It's it's also known as the Minsky cycle. It's not the George cycle, by the way. Uh, central banks loosen. Uh, at some point, for whatever reason, there is inflation. Um, then they have to tighten again. By the way, between loosening and inflation, this time around, it was 14 years. Um, then at some point after we see inflation, we're convinced that this inflation might stay there. Uh, central banks tighten again. The first thing that goes is financial markets. You get a financial recession. And the second thing that goes is the economy. Why? Because it's slower. Because Americans have 30-year mortgages. So higher interest rates don't really curtail um, consumption until somebody has to refinance. Brits, on the other hand, they have two and five-year mortgages. So a lot of them are now refinancing. They had a mortgage at 1%, and now they have a mortgage. They have to refinance at 5 and 6%, which is not very nice. So now they have to dole out more money to banks. It obviously that means they have to they have much less real disposable income to to consume. Um, so um, the the point I'm making is that also these cycles, the, the interest rate cycles, move very differently for different economies. And as we're going to see, that's why the, the world is is not going in the same direction anymore. It's it's very disjoint. But we are in the place now where we see the economic recession or at least a slowdown um, and we have experienced one financial accident but we're not at the point yet where all that is more important to central banks than inflation. Inflation hasn't come down enough or these accidents cum economic slowdown are not important enough to, to outweigh the, the other concern. Next slide please. And what makes it hard is that because the transmission mechanisms are different in each region, the economies are now in very different places. China is reopening, so its, um, its economy is doing very well. Uh, the Eurozone is, is doing very poorly, uh, conversely. Uh, the UK and the US, surprisingly, they're, they're moving uh, at roughly the same uh, Pace, although you know, in terms of actual growth, the US is outperforming the UK, has a lot of idiosyncratic issues. But this is a world that's very disjoint. And from a you know, think of it from a fund manager, money, money, money manager perspective. You have global assets, but you have a disjoint world. So that's the other thing. Whenever we talk in investment committees or when whenever you hear, you know, beautiful, bold people like me and James talk. We talk about the general picture and we try to produce a general outlook, but when all is said and done, it's different for every country. And that's what makes it so difficult. Um, next slide, please. Now let's talk a little bit about this dreaded inflation. It's coming down. 
And mercifully, uh, it's, it's coming down because the Chinese reopened, but they didn't, um, that reopening was not very inflationary so far that we can see, because that was one of my bigger, biggest fears going into 2023. China rebounding like that could help global inflation rebound, and who knows what might happen with interest rates thereafter. So after March and April, both in the UK and the US, headline inflation, all other things being equal, should be materially down. Why? Because if the price of, of this pan goes up 100% in a, from April 21 to April 22, uh, it's gone up 100%. Okay, it went from one pound to two pounds. But if it remains in, in two pounds by April 23, then inflation is back down to zero. This is the year-on-year -year effect. In, prices might remain elevated, but year-on-year, -year, that headline inflation, which is what makes the central banks react, can actually come much lower. So because last March and last April, inflation numbers were high in the US and the UK, we're going now as we enter this March and April, if inflation doesn't, doesn't accelerate again, they should start to come down materially. Uh, so next slide, please. Let's just look at this path for inflation for, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, that, that would be uh, the slide after that. Can you move on one slide, please? Um, thank you. Uh, if inflation persists at uh, not 0.4 uh, per month, which is what we've had uh, in, the, uh, in, in the US right now, it should be down to 4% in the summer, not 10, 4 Okay, so this is where inflation is going. For the UK, the number should be around five-ish, six-ish, okay, uh, by August or September. And that is all other things being equal, of course, if inflation um, doesn't accelerate again. Um, next slide, please. Now, as we said, China is not producing inflation, which is good. Okay, but we have a bigger problem. And the bigger problem here is um the uh deglobalization okay we went we had a world where the us and the soviet union were antagonizing for influence and they sort of divided the world and they say i'm going to influence these people you're going to influence these people and we'll try not to step on each other's toes you know obviously they didn't stick to the agreement either of them but um at least they managed to to stave off nuclear war now they knew uh, competition is between the United States and uh, China. And China, in the last 20 years, it was the world's manufacturer, the world's cheap manufacturer. You've all bought cheap products for your kids and you looked at them and you said, how can this thing cost 50 pounds? When I was growing up, it cost 500 pounds and I could never get my dad to buy me one of these. And now I can get it for my kid for 50 pounds. How did this happen? This is China producing stuff at a fraction of the price that developed markets did. And that was globalization. Next slide, please. The problem is that we're deglobalizing, or at least globalization has stopped. And that means China is not exporting deflation anymore. That's a big problem because that means we'll not be experiencing inflation of zero or one percent uh, going forward. And it's also continues to threaten global supply chain. So actually that pushes inflation even higher. Why is it doing that? Because now we have this competition. Think about it in terms of electric vehicles. Um, uh, about uh, some, some parts of, of the uh, electric vehicle, around 40 or 50% of them are manufactured in China. And some elements like graphite, for example, uh, you can really find them only in China or some earths to, to the uh, level of 95%. But the world needs to decarbonize. We all need to be driving electric vehicles in the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, depending on the region you're at. Um, so if China is holding a lot of those cars and we're antagonized with China, that transition might not be as smooth. And that is just one problem I'm highlighting to show you that this antagonism between the United States and China is going to lead to higher inflation and ultimately geopolitics is going to lead to, to slower growth and higher prices 
over the medium and long term. Okay, this is where the world is 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 heading. Um, now, uh, a couple of more slides. Um, um, sorry, and the next one, please, uh, Jordan. Sorry, I'm trying to, to rush the words to finish to leave some time for questions. In the meantime, let's see what's happening in the UK. The economy is not doing that bad. It could have been worse. So we were predicting the economy is pretty much flat. We're predicting uh, that it would be 1% down year on year. Uh, now the predictions are for a flat economy throughout 2023. Having said that, the UK housing market is, is not stressed, but it's negative. Now to a point, this is reasonable. During the pandemic, the government gave some incentives and people went ahead and bought their homes, but they did buy their homes. So, you know, those people are not going to buy a house again in two years. That demand was brought forward. So now we're facing the, the cliff edge. Um, there are reasons that the market is slightly resilient, which is that, you know, th there isn't much housing available. Um, and the pound has, has been, you know, weak. Um, versus other currencies, especially the dollar. But uh, ultimately, the housing market is slowing down. Um, and it's, it's much more difficult to buy for people to, to buy new homes. Their disposable income is, is lower, so they can't, it's more difficult for them to make their mortgage payments or even more difficult for them to, to put in the 10% the um, deposit. Okay, so... We are seeing not signs of stress, but signs of a material slowdown in the UK housing market. And as I said, inflation should be uh, should last longer than the rest of, of uh, the globe because of idiosyncratic issues well known in, in the UK. Um, next slide. Uh, the OBR said something along the lines of... Um, 2.9% inflation at the end of the year. I wouldn't be surprised if it's around five or six. In fact, that's where most of the market is, is uh, most of the market is looking at. The Bank of England says four. So um, this is the state of the UK economy. Slower growth, longer and higher inflation versus everybody else and sort of a weak uh, housing market, but at least None of these things is, especially the housing market and growth, is not as bad as we thought it could have been early in the year. And part of that is China resurgent without inflation. So we get the, the growth feeding into the rest of the world without too much inflation attached to it. Um, so uh, ne next slide, please. Um, so some takeaways. Contagion has happened. More than one bank failed. Uh, but it was known weaknesses. Okay, it was regional banks, some regional bank in Europe uh, and in the US and Credit Suisse in Europe. And we're sort of seeing things contained. This is not a Lehman moment. This was not a Lehman moment. Why? Because the global banking system is better capitalized. We don't have a credit crunch yet. Um, you know, if interest rates stay very high for two or three years, then we can discuss about the credit crunch. Bar uh, Credit Suisse, no big names have, have really suffered. Deutsche Bank was teetering, but uh, I think it was uh, th th there were a few large trades apparently attached to that. Um, and the central banks have tools. They can throw money at the problem. And that money is not necessarily inflationary because they're just giving it to banks to plug holes. It doesn't reach consumers. Um, Risks exist, but ultimately it will fall upon policymakers to do uh, the right thing. And the market overall is, is not fundamentally unsound. Bond yields. If, you're, if you have a bond portfolio or a big part of your portfolio is a bond portfolio, you get a yield now. So that's a good reason to have a good diversified portfolio. But whatever the case, and when you speak to your managers, make sure they are well positioned for volatility. I, they have not sacrificed liquidity all these years to get a little higher yield and you go into stuff that's illiquid and you can't get out. And now that you know everybody's trying to, to go for the exit, uh, you, you'll be the last one out and that's, that's usually painful. You have to find and trust the good and active managers, i.e. the thoughtful people that's what you have to look for, people who are actually doing the thinking. And by that, I do not mean people who are 100% sure of anything, rather than the people who, e even if you see people you know, not being sure, that's probably a good sign these days. It means they are positioned accordingly. Um, 
And the last thing is that a lot of people, uh, as I said, for example, some of them are going to be looking at regional banks, whereas the good managers might buy the good ones. There are bad managers out there who might buy the bad ones and just expect mean reversion. At the time of volatility, mean reversion is not a given. Okay, so you know you don't expect to go back to the price you had for all regional banks in the U.S. a month ago. That probably will never happen. That's why you need not just to react to things or just buy anything that has fallen, but rather look to the good, active, thoughtful people. And with that, um, I will open again the conversation for some questions with the good and thoughtful Mr. James Hunter Jones. Great, um, George. Thank, thanks very much for that. Um, I think. Probably a good idea to kick off with quite a quite a broad question. Um, given all the, the the turmoil in markets, what do you say to the view that cash is king in 2023? With 10 percent inflation, the answer is no. Cash is not king, uh, and I understand the reasoning. If volatility, if there is a lot of volatility, then cash should be king. But no, is is the answer. The way it looks right now, good bonds with a yield are king. Okay, if you can take a little bit of volatility, that's 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 the king, right now, but not not cash. Gold is king, if if you know in some places, and we are overweight gold in our portfolios, by the way, but not cash. Thank you. Um, now, obviously, equities have had a very challenging time. How do you expect things to unfold from here, and? Do you have a view on the growth value dynamic where we've seen obviously value stocks have really done quite well and outperformed growth stocks over the last 12 months? Do you think something like that might continue from here? This year I'm agnostic and I would argue for good quality either way. You know, something value, value can mean cheap. We have to make sure what we mean by value. And regional banks are cheap. You can buy that if you want. I wouldn't. Um, Greek debt is cheap. You can buy some of that too. You'd help us out, but I wouldn't buy any, any of that either. Okay, so we have to distinguish between value and cheap. Um, so right now, James, I would be slightly agnostic in the sense that valuations for big tech have come down. So for this year and with all the volatility, I would focus on finding good companies and good growth rather than play this particular theme. I might play some themes in sectors, but not necessarily in styles. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um, there's been two questions I'd like to, I'd like to combine and uh, maybe answer myself, if I may. And uh, one is someone asked for, for, for a novice investor, what would be, what would be the, right, the right asset to buy? Um, and I'll start with that. I think that George has touched on a really interesting point about volatility and people acting irrationally. And I think one of the hardest things for uh, people who are just starting out on their investment journey and doing it themselves is how to stay cool, calm, and collective, uh, collected rather in those, uh, in those circumstances. And frankly, it's harder, it's harder than it appears. So I think that it's really important to speak to a professional, to speak to someone who who knows what they're doing, and ultimately, it's a good idea to to really find someone to partner up with. And there's been a question as well, which is, how do you find a good money manager? Uh, and so I think that that sort of feeds nicely into this. And I think that it's really important in these situations. First of all, a money manager is is a person, so it's got to be someone that that you get on with that you understand that you really you can relate to and enjoy enjoy talking to because potentially you're going to be spending a lot of time talking to them um, but there are other things to look at you can look at investment performance that's really important you can look at how well you understand the investment proposition and the portfolio and does it <clears throat> does it seem that that portfolio is right given your tolerance for risk and how comfortable you might be with with volatility so I hope that goes some way to answering those those two questions, but I do feel like they're two sides of the same the same coin. Um, thank you, uh, James. Would you mind if I speed answer some of the questions that I see on the chat because we have nine open? 
So let me attempt to address this in five minutes. Um, fund managers, are they able to pick the banks that will not have a bank run? Absolutely not. But they can pick the ones with a healthy budget, with a healthy balance sheet, and assume that these ones will not have a bank run. You know, having said that, if Twitter decides to to uh, to break any bank, they can do that. But you rely on the idea that a good um, bank will not have uh, will not see a bank run. Um, it's very interesting chart on crisis provoked by the level of nominal policy rates. But what happens to real policy rates? I, if you exclude inflation. Actually, this is a very good question, uh, Mr. Mike Turner, and I will rerun this chart with real rates and then get back to you uh, on that. Having said that, I do feel, and at least the chart showed me, that it's the nominal interest rate where that, that is causing crisis, not so much the real one. But I will check it out and, and get back to you. How do you find a good money manager? You come to Mazars, we're going to find one for you. You mentioned commercial property on slide 10. Please comment on the sector. Yes. So. Commercial property, a lot of people are working hybrid uh, and offices are empty on Monday and, and Friday, but companies still have to pay for them. And obviously everybody's now trying to negotiate their lease down. So post pandemic, it's been very difficult for the, for the commercial real estate. Plus what was uh, your main street shop is now an online shop. So more problems there. Uh, so commercial property is having problems. And because there's a lot of, of exposure to commercial property over the years, it had a good yield. You can get money every month if you hold commercial property. Obviously, this is the next area where we're focusing on and try to find exposures. One of the reasons Deutsche Bank suffered last week, it's because of uh, 17 billion uh, exposure in commercial property. Um, if you look at the dividend yield on equities, S&P and FTSE compared with bond yields, assuming earnings are going to be hit by an upcoming recession, do you expect equities to continue to continue to struggle next year? Yes, but not because of the dividend. It's because of the policy uncertainty. That's what's going to be driving things. Uh, you know, having said that, if I had a uh, long 10-year view, the fact that they're going to struggle is also going to give me some good entry points. Okay, if you're thinking in terms of portfolios, that's what you need to be thinking. You should not be buying when everything is very high. You should be buying when, when people are struggling. Um, I've been hearing that Elon Musk has run into trouble. Would you advise against investing in his electric car shares? I do not have an opinion on, on Tesla, to, to be sure. Um, so just refrain from that. We, we don't generally offer opinions on, on single shares. Given increased volatility of, in the markets, is the investment committee looking to move larger parts of the portfolio to more actively managed funds? The answer is we're looking at all actively managed funds, but right now, yes, we would have a bias towards the good active managers versus, for example, positioning in a new ETF. Does geopolitical risk play in your thinking? Absolutely. That has been made clear in our um uh, in our introduction, um, we care about what happens in global supply chains and how this is going to affect growth and inflation. And we understand that these decisions are political. Okay, They're just one region hitting the other region and then things get more expensive and growth comes down. So it definitely does play um, a, you know, a, a part. Having said that, I don't have an opinion on the war in Ukraine because I'm a very poor war analyst. Um, about a year ago, I didn't think uh, Russia would, would go for it. Okay, so yes, of course, it does, play, uh, it does play a big role, but obviously we cannot get everything right. Um, thoughts on investment in property at the moment, if people are exiting due to increased interest rates and prices are softening. Uh, to quote uh, Edmund de Rothschild, when there's blood running on the streets, buy property, but... Um, there are opportunities out there uh, to be certain, but uh, I think that there could be more opportunities as interest rates remain high because property prices, okay, depending if you're in the US or in the UK, it's a different market, uh, but property prices could come under further and considerable stress. Okay, so it, it becomes a question, do you want to enter at medium valuations, low valuations, very low valuations, and how long do you want to wait for recovery? So it's one of those things where it's really up to the individual, and it's, it's a long discussion. Yeah, the, this sort of question would have an individual answer. Um, so with this, we managed to answer all questions. Um,
and feel free to email us if, if you have any more. Um, and have a very nice afternoon. Thank you very much.